you all for coming together for this. Now, we are gracious to have an excellent panel with, her, with us here tonight, and I'm going to turn over the microphone right now to, back to Tom Arabia from the ISO to move on with the program, as I'm sure that we're eager to hear what they have to say and not waste any more time on this. Thank you so much. And, uh, of course, Professor Noam Chomsky. So I can go on with the introduction of Noam Chomsky then? No. <laughs> I, in fact, I'll just let him take it from here. Thank you, Noam. There are uh, quite a range of topics to talk about. It's a lot of complex issues. Uh, I, I have a few minutes. I don't want to speak too long. And I'll just pick two topics and try to focus on them. Uh, a couple of words about something else. Uh, the two topics are, I'm not going to talk about the atrocities that took place in the last few weeks. I'm sure you're quite familiar with that. Uh, one question uh, has to do with the uh, legitimacy of the U.S.-Israeli invasion. And we should bear in mind, crucially, that it's a U.S.-Israeli invasion. Right. Uh, we're critically involved uh, at, at every level. So one has to do with its legitimacy. Uh, the second question has to, that I want to talk about has to do with the reasons for it. Now, the two are intertwined, so what I say won't be entirely separated, segregated, uh, but I'll try to do it systematically. Now, as far as the legitimacy is concerned, it's almost universally assumed in commentary that, uh, a, that the invasion is legitimate uh, it's criticized as being uh, disproportionate, but it's legitimate because obviously a state has the result to defend itself against uh, attacks from the outside. Uh, well, that, uh, uh, there's a certain level of truth to that argument. Yes, a state has a right to defend itself uh, from attack, but this argument moves very quickly to uh, another position, namely that a state has the right to defend itself by force from attacks from the outside. And nobody believes that. Uh, if that's supposed to be the principle, it's, I think, universally rejected. So no one agrees that, uh, say, Nazi Germany uh, had a right to defend itself against, by force against the terror of the partisans in occupied Europe. Uh, nobody, I suspect very few people here or around us would believe that uh, the British had the right to defend themselves by force against uh, George Washington's army. Uh, and the reasons are obvious. Uh, in both cases, they had no reason to be there in the first place. Uh, so therefore, I have no right of defense by force. Uh, and there was, there was an easy way to defend themselves, put a stop to the atrocities and the invasion and the aggression. And when that option is available, you just don't have the right to uh, defend yourself by force uh, or take, say, uh, uh, a useful analog, take the British in, uh, in Northern Ireland. I mean, IRA terror was certainly criminal, uh, and the British had a right to defend themselves from it. How? Not, not by violence, not by terrorizing the uh, Irish Catholic community, uh, but by uh, addressing the grievances that led to the violence. And when they finally began to do so, the terror stopped. Uh, and you can think of case after case like that. So the universal agreement that uh, Israel had a right to defend itself by force is not only wrong, but is transparently wrong. Uh, wrong on the basis of principles that virtually everyone accepts. Uh, well, there's plainly a if, if that reasoning is correct, there's plainly a, a crucial educational problem to face. 
bring people to understand that by their own principles, their conclusions are absolutely illegitimate. And the reasoning's not profound, uh, nothing deep about it, it's uh, all on the surface. Uh, well, this, uh, let's turn to reasons. What were the reasons for the attack? Uh, there's an official reason that was given, for example, by uh, Ehud Barak, uh, defense minister, who said uh, Israel's had lost patience with the rocket attacks and therefore had to invade. That, of course, and that's ex accepted almost universally then there are debates about proportionality. Uh, but that has the same uh, fallacy. You have to show that uh, a reaction by force to rocket, you have, a, you have a right to defend yourself from rocket attacks, surely, but it takes a, another step in the argument to show that you have the right to defend yourself by force against rocket attacks, as in the examples I mentioned and numerous others. Uh, and to show that, you have to show that there were no peaceful alternatives to doing so. Well, that doesn't have to be true. There are plenty of peaceful alternatives. I'll come to them in a minute. Uh, other, uh, there has been further debate about the discussion about the reasons. One commonly proposed argument, which I think is accurate, is that Israel uh, uh, had to overcome the, uh, what they call the lessons of the failed Lebanon War in 2006, uh, when Israel lost what's called credibility. Uh, its deterrent capability. Uh, to put that in simple English, it had lost the uh, ability to uh, intimidate uh, its adversaries into submission by the threat of extreme violence, and they had to recover that capability. It was probably a factor. Uh, as for the timing, probably had to do mostly with the Israeli elections, in fact, which are coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, one Israeli commentator uh, calculated at the very beginning of the war that for every 40 uh, Palestinians killed, uh, Barak gained one parliamentary seat. Uh, I'm not sure his arithmetic was exactly right, but the principle is, if you compare the polls and the casualties, uh, it comes out more or less like that. But none of that gets to the reasons. I think the reasons are different and much deeper. The reasons have to, uh, are pretty much explicit. Uh, uh, they were explained by uh, uh, Ehud Omar, Omar, the Prime Minister, back right here in the United States in May 2006. Uh, he gave a speech to a, 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 a joint session of Congress, uh, rousing ovations, uh, when he explained two points. One, a, a principle, another uh, implementation of it. The principle, he said, is that the historic right of the Jewish people to the land of Israel can't, is beyond challenge, rousing ovation. Uh, there's a corollary to that. Uh, the, the original population doesn't have a right there. And in fact, the US and Israel just uh, took that position formally at the United Nations. Uh, once again, last, last month, last, in December, there was a series of UN resolutions that were passed, uh, mostly by about the same vote, something like, you know, 170 to 3 or something like that. Uh, this one passed uh, 173 to 5. Uh, it was on the right of Palestinians to self-determination. Uh, the five against were the United States, Israel, a couple of Pacific Islands. You know, that's the usual, usual vote in the United Nations. And as usual, it doesn't get reported. So, for example, also unreported was the fact that uh, there was a resolution on the right to food. Huge problem now. It's a billion people facing starvation. It's far worse than the financial crisis. But, of course, that you know, deals with what one British diplomatic historian called the unpeople, the ones who are different from us. You know. So not discussed much. The vote on that was uh, unanimous with one vote against, namely the United States. Uh, there was a vote on uh, uh, arms traffic. The United States is by far the biggest uh, arms trafficker. And this was to regulate the arms traffic. Uh, the, uh, in 2006, the United States voted against that alone. This time it had company, uh, Zimbabwe, 
so there's two of us vote against it. Uh, none of this obviously can get reported. But the one on the Palestinians is interesting. Uh, no right of self-determination. And that's a corollary to the conclusion that uh, the historic rights of Israel to the land of, to the, of the Jewish people to the land of Israel are beyond question to go together. Actually, if you look at the colloquy at the United Nations, there were various excuses, but rather pathetic excuses as to why the U.S. had to vote that way, but we uh, didn't go into that. Uh, so that's, one, that's a principle. Uh, then comes the question of implementation. And Omer also, at the same time, May 2006, uh, explained the implementation. It's the program that he called Convergence. Uh, Israel does not want to take over. The, there, there were sections and still are sections in Israel that want to take over the entire West Bank. Uh, but the more rational people understand that that's a problem. Uh, it leads to what's called a demographic problem. Uh, there'll be too many Palestinians in a... Uh, in, in the state, and the, if it's at all democratic, it won't be a Jewish state. So you have the problem of how to keep a Jewish state while taking over what you want in the West Bank. And on the side, it's not in question that all of the actions in the West Bank are illegal, uh, in violation of uh, the foundations of uh, international humanitarian law, the Geneva Conventions. In fact, the Israeli government was informed of that in 1967 by its own top legal representatives, including the justice minister. So uh, and it's been uh, ratified by the International Court of Justice, the World Court, in a unanimous decision, including, uh, including the U.S. justice. So there's no real debate about that. Everything that's going on there is criminal. Uh, and the U.S. has a... Uh, uh, as what's, what's called the high contracting party to the Geneva Conventions, uh, has the legal responsibility of acting to prevent it. Not doing so is also criminal, and directly uh, abetting it by uh, uh, economic, military, ideological, uh, other means is you know, multiply criminal. So the criminality of all these actions in Washington and Tel Aviv is not in question. But it's accepted universally that somehow that is, that's okay. Uh, the, uh, in other words, the United States is, regards itself as an outlaw state. Uh, it's uh, commentators, intellectuals, media accept that. And that uh, right of being an outlaw state is inherited by its clients. So the issue of criminality is kind of off the agenda. Uh, how do you go about uh, taking what you want in the occupied territories without running into the demographic problem. Well, there's a way. Uh, traces way back to 1967. It's taken various forms since. Uh, Olmert's version was that uh, Israel should an annex everything within what's called the separation wall. It's an annexation wall, actually. Uh, it should uh, proceed, as it's been doing, to take over the Jordan Valley that's about a third of the West Bank. Uh, it'll, uh, 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 it, that imprisons what, what's inside. Of course, Israel has uh, total control of the air and so on. Uh, but what's inside, the imprisoned part, has to be broken up into cantons. You take a look at the settlement map. There are two salients, actually three salients, that cut through the West Bank you know, from the part that Israel will annex uh, within the separation wall up to the Jordan Valley. Uh, one goes east of Jerusalem. What's called Jerusalem is Ill illegally annexed, but illegally annexed by, uh, in violation of Security Council resolutions that go back uh, 40 years. Uh, but the U.S. accepts it, so it's okay. Uh, by now, it's greater Jerusalem, much expanded. And to the east of it, there's a town, Ma'ala Adumim, which was a developed mostly in the Clinton years uh, with the purpose of bisecting the West Bank. Uh, and uh, to the north, there are two other salients. One go to the town of Ariel, the other to Gedumim. Uh, that breaks up what's left. And then there's what uh, you know, a complex network of uh, checkpoints and barriers and so on, uh, which have no security function except in the sense that they 
undermine the possibility of any uh, civilized life for the uh, animals that are wandering around in uh, uh, the rest of the territory. Uh, well, that proceeding in that way, Israel could take over what's valuable for it in the West Bank, the arable land, the pleasant suburbs around uh, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, uh, the water resources they'll have control of, uh, the Jordan Valley, fertile area, and also prisons, everything, and uh, everything else that goes through. And it doesn't have any responsibility for the Palestinians. Uh, what will happen to them? Well, it was made pretty clear right at the beginning of the occupation uh, by uh, actually the person that was clearest uh, was uh, Moshe Dayan, who was the defense minister in charge of the occupied territories. And among the leadership, uh, perhaps the person most sympathetic to the plight of the Palestinians, he recognized it and understood it. And his position was that uh, what we're doing to you, the Palestinians, is very much like uh, a Bedouin who kidnaps a young woman uh, and uh, forces her to marry him, and ultimately she'll accept it. So ultimately you'll accept what we're doing to you. And you, otherwise, as he put it, you will live like dogs, uh, and those who want to leave can leave. Uh, and we'll see where that goes. Nothing secret about this, you know, public record from 1967, and it's implemented since. It's not words repeated in one or another form, and it's implemented. Uh, those are the settlement programs, the development programs, which uh, you and I pay for in a lot of ways, not just financially, but uh, militarily, diplomatically, and in other ways. Well, that's uh, the way to implement the historic right of the Jewish people to all of Palestine, uh, without running into the feared demographic problem. There's also the problem of the, uh, the uh, uh, Palestinian, the non-Jewish citizens of Israel, mostly Arab. Uh, that can be handled in various ways. Uh, one way, in fact, was just uh, uh, proposed by the Electoral Commission uh, a couple of weeks ago. It uh, banned participation of the Arab parties in the coming election. Now, that's unlikely to stand. The courts, I think, are not likely to let that stand. It's too blatant uh, and overt a violation, violation of minimal uh, democratic practice. But in one way or another, they can be marginalized and kept out. And there's a further plan, which is accepted pretty much across the spectrum. And that is that means have to be found to encourage the uh, Palestinian Arab pop, uh, citizens to leave the citizens of Israel to leave, either by direct transfer or by, with, with, by redrawing borders, uh, so that the heavily settled uh, uh, parts of, say, the Galilee will be transferred into one of those segregated uh, cantons that be, could be called a Palestinian state someday, uh, meaningless. Uh, so those are ways of practically implementing the uh, uh, the program of the dual program of uh, recognizing the that the historic rights of the Jewish people are beyond to the entire land are beyond question and doing it in such a way that it can remain uh, free from the demographic problem the dangerous problem of having non-Jews in a Jewish state uh, and those are not just proposals I mean they're being implemented every day you know, going on constantly well, those proposals can be implemented only if there's no resistance to them. Now, in the West Bank by now, there's very little resistance uh, because of uh, Israeli violence, which, which has indeed uh, subdued the population, and by now because of collaborationist uh, Palestinian forces. Uh, as I'm sure you know, Israel's, uh, the United States with its allies, the Arab dictatorships, uh, Jordan, Egypt, have uh, trained uh, security forces, uh, Fatah security forces, whose main task is to subdue the population. Uh, so if they have a, if they have a demonstration uh, you know, against the atrocities in, uh, in Gaza, then instead of the Israeli army going in, they'll do it. That's a typical colonial pattern. You know, it's the whole history of colonialism works like that. Uh, I won't run through the details, but it's absolutely common, very common. Uh, and so like to say India was, uh, the population was mostly kept under control by 
uh, Indian soldiers under British command. Uh, and, and it's just a typical and natural uh, uh, procedure. Uh, in Chechnya today, for, uh, it's kept subdued and quiet and developing and so on uh, under Chechen military forces with the Russians in the background in case anything goes wrong. It's routine and it's being duplicated in the West Bank. Well, okay, they've pretty much subdued protest in the West Bank so they can carry out the policies without disturbance, but they haven't yet subdued Gaza. Uh, Gaza, you still have resistance. Now remember, Gaza and the West Bank are one unit. Now, furthermore, they are both occupied. There's no question that Gaza is occupied. Uh, you know, even as sane Israeli commentators point out that there's never been a day that it hasn't been under occupation. Uh, there's talk about you know, the famous disengagement, uh, but I mean, that, that was a well-organized scam. Uh, hardline, hardliners in Israel, like Ariel Sharon, the patron saint of the settlers, uh, understood that it's completely senseless to keep uh, several thousand Jewish settlers uh, in the ruins of Gaza, which they had already pretty much destroyed, uh, taking a large part of the uh, land and uh, the scarce resources like water and protected from you know, a million and a half people by a big component of the IDF, the Israeli army. That's just crazy. Uh, so what makes sense is to essentially transfer them to valuable territory. Uh, they're subsidized to go to Gaza, so fine, you load them up in trucks and uh, take them over to be illegally subsidized in the West Bank, which you want to keep, which is what happened. I mean, when they announced the disengagement, they also, at the same time, announced new settlement programs in the West Bank. And most of them went there, some went to the illegally occupied Golan Heights, uh, that's almost all of them. Uh, this had to be presented as a trauma, a national trauma, because you had to have images on the front pages of the newspapers about, uh, you may remember the Boston Globe, uh, pathetic little boy, uh, you know, pleading, pleading with the soldiers not to take them away and you know, destroying their homes. Uh, you can have cries of never again. It's kind of like the Nazis and so on. They all totally faked. I mean, if they wanted to remove the settlers, there was nothing easier. They could have simply announced on August 1st, the Israeli army is going to leave the Gaza. Two days later, the people who lived there would have climbed into the lorries provided for them and quietly gone to their new subsidized homes in the illegal settlements in the West Bank. But then you wouldn't have had a national trauma and you wouldn't be able to shout never again and so on. There's a lesson, lesson in this because it also has to do with the possibilities of dealing with the settlements in the occupied territories. And the, West, the rest of the occupied territories, the West Bank, it's very commonly argued that if the Israeli army, that there's no possibility of a, a two-state settlement because if the Israeli army tried to forcefully remove the settlers, there would be a civil war. And that's probably true. Uh, the, uh, the religious nationalist settlers have uh, such a powerful role inside Israel, in particular in the Israeli army, that they might just refuse to carry, especially at the officer corps, uh, many of them obey the rabbis, not the state, openly. So yes, they might refuse to do it, have battles, uh, could be a civil war. But there's no reason for any of that. Uh, to eliminate the settlements in the West Bank is a trivial move. Just withdraw the army uh, and the settlers will divide. The, many of them are just there because they're paid uh, to have a decent quality of life. Okay, so they'll go back and be paid to be within the uh, borders of Israel. There will be uh, uh, nationalist religious groups that will fight to hang on to every you know, a clod of earth, okay, they can be left to their own devices. Uh, they can stay in, under Palestinian authority or they can leave too. Uh, but there doesn't have to be any civil war and there doesn't have to be any force. Uh, the mechanisms are straightforward. Uh, so that's not a barrier to proceeding to a political settlement. Uh, and this has been done. You know, there are many examples of this. Um, 
just to take one recent one, which was pretty dramatic, but can't be discussed here because of what it implies. Uh, the uh, uh, Indonesia in 1975 invaded uh, East Timor. And uh, you know, it's about as, but what happens is about as close to genocide as anything in the modern period. They killed hundreds of thousands of people, you know, maybe a quarter of the population, strongly backed by the United States, also Britain when the atrocities mounted, others. Uh, and they swore they were never going to leave. The general said, it's part of Indonesia, we're going to keep it, nothing the world can do about it. Well, in September 1999, under by then very serious international and domestic pressure, Clinton decided that it's enough. He told the Indonesian generals, sorry friends, the game is over, and they immediately withdrew. You can't stand up to the godfather. You know, that's, uh, it's just too dangerous. So, okay, that was the end of that. Now, that's gone down in history as a humanitarian intervention by the United States. Look how humanitarian we are. At first, we supported the invasion, you know, for 25 years, helped them destroy the population. And then when it just became too much of a bother to us, we told them to call it off. Okay, and they called it off. Yeah, okay. Uh, international affairs is... You know, there aren't many principles of international affairs, although scholars will tell you there are, but one principle that works pretty well is that international affairs are very much like the Mafia. And there's a godfather, and you better obey him or else you're in trouble. And then there are the, uh, what are called the intellectuals, who explain to you that what the godfather is doing is humane and just and the divine mission and so on and so forth. Uh, this is pretty much the way it works. And the same could work in the rest of the occupied territories. Uh, well, uh, does, let's go back to the question of legitimacy of, uh, of the attack. Are there peaceful alternatives for Israel when they're under rocket attack? Well, there, there are alternatives in a narrow sense and also in a broader sense. Now, the narrow sense is sometimes discussed. The narrow alternative is just to accept the ceasefire. Okay, that would mean ending the rocket attacks and opening the border. Okay, crucially opening the border. And there are agreements on paper about that. So in 2005, there was an agreement that uh, uh, Israel would allow continuous flow across the borders so the people can at least survive and uh, there would be no more violence. Well, a couple of months later, in January 2006, uh, Israel backed, re uh, rejected the agreement, as did the United States. And the reason is the Palestinians had committed a really grave crime. Uh, they had vite, voted the wrong way in a free election. And you don't do that. The godfather doesn't like that. Uh, so therefore, you have to be punished. And meanwhile, the intellectual community has to write uh, you know, uplifting articles about our yearning for democracy and so on and so forth. Uh, again, that's the way international affairs work uh, and the cultural system works. So Israel backed away from the agreement. And since then, there's been... Uh, no acceptance of that truth. Uh, actually, right before the, the present invasion, the latest invasion, December 27th, uh, the political leader of Hamas, uh, Khalid Mashal, uh, proposed that they go back to the 2005 agreement. Okay, no need for an invasion. Israel didn't even respond uh, to, the requ to the request. It was much better to attack than you can eliminate, try to eliminate, the last resistance to uh, the atrocities that continue every minute, uh, both in Gaza but more seriously in the West Bank, which they really care about and want to take over in the way I described. Uh, so that's a narrow proposal. You can accept the ceasefire. The broader proposal is very simple. Accept, uh, accept, the, accept international law, which is straightforward. You have no right to be in the occupied territories withdraw and allow Palestinian national self-determination in the released territories. That would be the West Bank and Gaza, 22% of the former Palestine. Now on that matter, there is an overwhelming international consensus. And there has been for over 30 years. Other topics that aren't discussed here. Uh, this 
proposal came to the Security Council of the United Nations in uh, January 1976. It was brought by the Arab, what are called the confrontation states, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, two-state settlement on the international borders, uh, incorporating all the wording of UN 242. Those of you who follow this know that that's the, at least in principle, that's what everyone accepts. So the right of Israel and every other state to live in peace and security within uh, uh, recognized borders and so on, and a Palestinian state in the released territories. Well, Israel was bitterly opposed to that. Uh, they actually carried out an action which presumably was directed against the UN. Uh, Israel bombed Lebanon for no pretext, uh, killing 50 people. It was kind of reported here, but you know, it's like a footnote. Rightly, it is a footnote. Uh, it was probably a, a message to the United Nations, don't fiddle around with us. Uh, and the US vetoed it. Okay, the Godfather took care of that. And there's a record, yeah, I'll be over. Uh, there's a record ever since, it's late, I won't run through it. Uh, but there is one break in the record, and it's important to recognize it, because it's significant for the future. In January 2001, there was one week of negotiations in Taba, Egypt, uh, in which Palestinians and Israelis negotiated, top negotiators, uh, dealing with the, the detailed issues about you know, borders, Jerusalem, uh, refugees, and so on. And they came pretty close to an agreement. In fact, in their last press conference, they said if they had a couple of more days, they probably could have reached a settlement in terms of the international consensus. Uh, well, Israel called off the negotiations prematurely. That was the end of that. But 2001 isn't that long ago. You know, it's not that it's uh, reaching for pie in the sky. I mean, that can be resumed. What's required is that the godfather agree to what he agreed to in, um, in, in, in Indonesia in 1991. Just say, OK, game is over. Uh, and you have simple ways to proceed to achieve the international consensus. Right now, the US and Israel are absolutely isolated on this. Uh, Hamas accepts it. Uh, Hezbollah has said they won't disrupt anything that the uh, Palestinians accept. Uh, Iran, Iran has said the same. Uh, the, the rest of the world's in favor of it. It's the US and Israel, and the US is the crucial actor all the way through because of its power. Uh, so it's really in our hands. Uh, and that means, I'll just say one more word on, you know, there's a lot of talk about trying to apply the kinds of tactics that were used in the case of South African apartheid. But think that through. You know, I mean, it's tempting, I agree, you know, boycott, divestment, sanctions. Think it through. The South African boycott, divestment, and sanctions were effective after decades of education and organizing in the 1980s, at a point when Congress was passing legislation uh, in favor of boycott, barring U.S. trade, uh, uh, mayors were getting arrested, uh, you know, uh, protesting against apartheid. The American corporations were protesting against it. Okay, at that point, people understood what was going on, and uh, you could have an effective campaign. And the same would be true in this case. If people understood what was going on, what you're doing, you could have that kind of campaign. But this is different. You don't need the campaign. If people understood what was going on, you could settle the problem without that, namely by getting the United States to withdraw its, uh, its re extreme rejectionism. And I think that focuses on the task that's really in front of us. It's an educating and organizing task the one that was carried out over a long time to lead to uh, you know, overwhelming opposition to apartheid, okay? Then you can do things about it. And it's not easy. And the apartheid case uh, indicates why. So in the 1980s, Congress did uh, legislate an end to US trade with South Africa. The Reagan administration evaded it. Uh, and in fact, trade increased. Uh, as late as 1988, the Pentagon declared the African National Congress 
Nelson Mandela to be one of the more notorious terrorist groups in the world. It's 1988. That's uh, Colin Powell's Pentagon. Uh, the, uh, uh, in fact, you may know that Mandela was removed from the terrorist list just a couple of months ago. I guess it was becoming too much of an embarrassment. So, you know, you have to, I mean, even if, uh, you know, even at the time when you really have the basis for achieving something, you've got to compel the U.S. government to go along with it. They've got their own interests and their own constituency. But it can be done, and it was done, and it can be done in this case too, but not without a lot of work. Professor Noam Chomsky.